the toothpick ready. Good evening. It's uh, Wednesday, 9 p.m. This is the What Not Podcast. I'm Mike Z. I'm Chris, and I don't know what you were doing, but I'm glad you decided to step on over here just to see what we were up to. Yeah. Yeah, I've got a special guest, and you might look down there to see him. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> wait, where's he? That, that guy over there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Wait, you're, yeah, you're, wait, no, you're over there. <laughs> it's a little backwards. It's all backwards. Oh, good evening, Chris. Good evening, Brian. And so this is Zach Manring, the Southern Ginger Workshop. So they the say man, the man who's got his hands in a lot of different pots of yeah. woodworking related issues, <laughs> off roading <laughs> issues, RVing issues. Yeah. You name it. Wonderful. And now Jeep issues. Oh, Lord. Yeah. What are we getting into with the Jeep? Yeah, yeah. a lot of issues there. I mean, uh, I mean, <laughs> it's, it's always something. It's always something. Um, yeah, so I mean, do you want to get into an intro or how do you want to? Yeah, who are you? What do you do? Uh, yeah, so um, I guess I'm Zach, as you mentioned, uh, Southern Ginger Workshop. We um, I started uh, YouTube maybe five years ago or so, and um, you know, just started with woodworking, started with DIY, and then kind of when I built the the um, the brand, the Southern Ginger Workshop, I wanted to make sure it wasn't kind of tied to you know woodworking only. Um, so I tried my best to, to mix it up. It wasn't always about woodworking. Um, that's where the, like the teardrop trailer build, uh, came into play. And then the RV stuff kind of came into play and then a little bit of off-roading. And I actually started a, another, um, a YouTube channel just for the off-roading cause I didn't want to get it too mixed up with the Southern ginger world stuff. So, um, yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm all over the place doing all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you kind of head up a couple uh, Facebook groups as well, I believe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I started um, uh, Southern Woodworkers, um, which is one of the, yep, there it is. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, we're up to about uh, about 2,000 or so folks in there, and uh, it's a pretty active group. And I love checking in there, see what people are all up to. And, you know, fellow people in the community, as well as newcomers, come in there and asking questions and helping out other woodworkers. It's It's a great, great place. Yeah. So, so if you're, it's a Southern woodworker. So if, if someone lived in Maine, could they join your group? They cannot. Oh, amazing. it's exclusive. There, it there is some South special weather. consideration though. There, there are a few. Yeah. I mean, if you're good friends with me, you know, <laughs> if you know the admin, you might be able to get in. Yeah. Um, no, we try to keep it to the South because originally we wanted it to be, um, I mean, this is, you know, the pre virus days, but we, um, we wanted to keep it local because we wanted people to be able to meet and greet locally to, you know, fellow shops and that kind of stuff. And we actually started meetups. We called them lollygags um, early on. And unfortunately, they kind of just dwindled away. But, you know, we wanted people to be able to go to from shop to shop and visit your shop or my shop and and kind of get ideas and maybe come up with layout ideas and that kind of stuff. And, you know, just just have a good time. And that's why we wanted to keep it kind of local to the uh, the southern um, kind of states because we thought within you know a couple hour drive people would be willing to do that. Yeah, if someone's traveling through kind of thing, stop at someone's shop and hang out, yep. have yep. a lollygag. To have a lollygag, and then you know then it kind of grew into doing shows and stuff, which was always fun. Um, we did the cling sport show as well, um, but the woodworking shows here in Atlanta was always a big part of ours because you know it's right here local to us and. You know, we're able to uh, to accommodate. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I think that would be uh, would be neat. I'm sure a lot of people would love to. After the past two years, they'd love to try to find something to just get out and do. 
for sure. Yeah, we keep a close eye on the um, the woodworking show circuit, which from the latest I've heard, I think um, Atlanta's out of the circuit, unfortunately. So, but we're keeping an eye on it. Maybe there's some other places we can go or and have those kind of meetups because it's always good to see everybody and meet and greet and hang out with folks such as yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's my, uh, my understanding. There's going to be a show in October somewhere. Uh, oh yeah, in the Hickory area. Oh yeah, really? Oh, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, that's nice, nice, nice plug. Nice plug. Yeah, yeah, that was pretty nice plug. Not sponsored. Uh, I was going to say, give me a second. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe someone sponsored. I hit the wrong one. Sorry. <laughs> nice, <laughs> nice plug. I like it. Oh, yeah, it's completely not sponsored, but you know, hey, we're always willing to take it. I like it. Is this uh, is this actually going to be in person and everything this year? That's the plan. Nice. Nice. Yeah. But plans nowadays are always <clears throat> edited in pencil because you just never know. Agreed. Yeah. Cause this past year, um, it would have probably been okay in person. The downside was, is that no one had any products. So it would have mm. been a really quiet show. You know, there wouldn't have been too much going on. Yeah. So there. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's, that's a fair point. I didn't even think about that. Uh, a lot of the inventory is low as well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so not only people being kind of afraid to go out or, you know, mingling with folks, the products are low too. Uh, Gerald would like to know if Southern Woodworkers will be at WorkbenchCon this year. Um, we might have some representation there, like folks that are in the group, but um, no, there's, there's no plan to have a booth or anything like that there. Yeah, it'd be interesting to see what they do this year. They've had mm-hmm. a hiatus. Yeah, I've been to uh, the last couple ones that were out there. Um, just kind of snuck in, if you will. <laughs> but uh, helping, you know, helping out um, companies that were having boosts and just kind of helping, you know, where I could help, I try to help uh, with the Workbench Con. It's pretty close to, to home. And I think this year I saw it's it's going to be uh, in Marietta, so even closer, um, just outside, cool. just north of Atlanta. Yeah, I was going to say, so basically, if you want free tickets to WorkbenchCon, find a vendor that you can help help with at their booth for the day like Zach did. There you go. There you, you go. Get in. No problem. That's 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 the trick. <laughs> oh, hey, Angus, that's right. It's your birthday. Happy birthday there, buddy. Yeah, happy birthday, Angus. And then Kyle Ely, what's up? What's Missed up? Missed you last week. Oh, so since you're into CNC, you might want to know a little bit about Kyle. Kyle is part of uh, LearnYourCNC.com. Nice. 100% not sponsored, but we enjoy <laughs> his program. Uh, he does Vetric, all levels of Vetric, nice. you know, from 2D up to uh, Aspire, and he has a course that you can take and learn at your own pace. So we like Pretty to. cool. Yeah, I saw that he, uh, he's he been on the show a couple times. That's cool. Yep. And he'll be at WorkBeachCon <clears throat> this year. Sweet. Look at him networking, man! I'll tell yeah, you, I love it. I mean, that he, guy he, he quits his he quits his day job and just just becomes the network master. It just goes everywhere. Um, <laughs> sorry, Dave. That's all, Dave. So yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure there'll be a new one for some reason at some point. I heard around. there's a new one already. It's called J something. It's gonna start to letter J. Did they start a new alphabet instead of Greek? They ran out of letters. Yeah, exactly. Well, in October, it'll be the uh, Octacon variant. There you yes, go. They'll just go into shapes at that point. <laughs> Start getting into the Apple product naming. That's it. Kyle, uh, where's Kyle located? Is he here local? Pennsylvania? Uh, he's up Pennsylvania. north in PA. Oh, okay. Right on. But hey, nice. we know the uh, we know the admin of Southern Woodworkers, Cal. If you just want to stop in and <laughs> just check out. it out, yeah, just yeah. say that you know answer the questions with Zach on everything, and you'll be in. That's yeah, right. Zach knows me. Yeah, that's a good way to get in. Northeast PA. Very nice. <laughs> so yeah, uh, WorkbenchCon. Um, I, you know, it'll be interesting to see. I didn't see the schedule so far this year to see what they're going to have there. I haven't either. We're hoping to get Chris there. Yeah, if Kyle's going, I've got to go now. I mean, it's I just, do. you know, got to meet the dude in person. Yeah. yeah All the do. chats and back and forths and texts we've had. It's just, you know. Yeah, and if I mean, if you can't make it in the building, there's definitely after parties and before parties and during parties <laughs> that you can go to. Just make sure you get to the lobby bar earlier than later because they exactly. only have one place. Yeah. That was that was a madhouse. <clears throat> Yeah, usually it's a uh, like a hotel lobby or something where everybody's at, and it's it's crowded. It gets real crowded, but it's a lot of fun. Chris, you should go. You really should. You should go. It's technically not up to me. 
It's not that far for you. Yeah, well, <laughs> it's still not up to him. Yeah. <laughs> yeah there you go. Kyle, not Kyle not stopped, sponsored. Yeah, not not sponsored. Kyle, stop by, pick you up. You guys can road trip down. There you go on the way down. Yeah, there you go. Kyle's got to take like eighty five on the way down. He'll he'll pick you up on the way. Are you guys off of forty? Yep. Mm-hmm. See, there you go. Bring the RV. It'll be great. There you go. Bring the RV. So yeah. speaking speaking of our oh, well actually let's do the woodworking part because that's what you got started into first with YouTube and everything. Mm. Yeah. Okay. So how did that begin? Was it, it? It. I hate to say it like this, but it looked like it was a basement garage, something you converted or something you just. Yeah. No, it is. Yeah, you nailed it. Um. So I've been. I mean, I've been woodworking. I think like most people, kind of all my life, and just you know, tinkering in the shop. My dad had a woodworking shop. He's built some cool stuff. And, you know, in the old 10 by 10, 10, um, you know, the 10 woodworking shops and stuff. And, you know, and it was cool. And then, um, you know, when I moved uh, to, I actually grew up in Maryland. And when I moved down here to Atlanta and started renting around, um, I rented a house. And when I, once I rented a house with a garage, I had some space. And I was like, okay, now, uh, now I have some time to actually build out a shop. And, um, you know, I picked up a couple minor things like a, um, like a miter saw and, and some, uh, a joiner. And then I think I picked up a, um, a shop Smith, you know, like a lot of folks, you know, they play with them, shop Smith stuff and it, you know, it was a two car garage, so it's not huge, but it was enough for me to kind of get my feet wet again. And then after about a year, um, uh, year or two, um, doing that, I moved to the place I'm at now, my house now, and I have a full basement and it's completely unfinished. So one of the first, literally the first thing I did was create a shop uh, down in the basement and um, walled it off and, you know, created something that I wanted to, to use. And I still use it to this day. I was, I mean, of course I was down there a few minutes ago. Um, It's great. Just be able to walk downstairs and, you know, cut a piece of wood or, you know, um, put another coat of finish on something, you know, and then just walk back upstairs and enjoy the rest of the day. So it's, it's been great. Um, and then now that that's been going well, I've actually started building a, um, a second shop. Um, but it's, it's more mechanical stuff like, uh, metalworking and mechanic shop style stuff, more for cars and off-roading equipment and stuff like that. I was going to say fixing all of the uh, accidents that happen when you're off-roading. <clears throat> yeah, exactly. Like I, this couple of weeks ago, we were out, uh, off-roading, I knocked a fender off. So I'll be fixing that soon. And then of course, just normal maintenance, like, you know, change the oils and the vehicles and, you know, that kind of stuff. It's good to have a shop for that. That's very cool. So how did you get into RVing? Because that really kind of became a big part of your life there for a while. And it still is. It still is. It really is. Yeah. Um, So uh, as some folks may may already know, I I, one of the, during the woodworking stint on YouTube, I created the, um, you know, a teardrop trailer, which is nothing new. People have been in teardrops since, you know, the 1920s. Um, but I just created one from scratch should uh, just, you know, just, just to be like, yeah, I think I could build something like that. And, um, I didn't have a plan or anything like that when I built it. I just kind of went as I, you know, went along as I do the project and said, okay, well, the first part of this is we need a floor. And the second part is I need walls. And then we, you know, let me design the walls. And then once I had the walls, I was like, all right, I need to, you know, um, figure out the, um, the electrical and that kind of stuff. So I just kind of each step of the way I've kind of figured it out as I went, as opposed to trying to plan the whole thing out and then start. Mm -hmm. Um, And I think that was good because it allowed me to, you know, be kind of creative, you know, from a creative, creative standpoint, I was, I was kind of like, you know, a polyglot being able to move around and and try something new, um, which was cool. So immediately after that um, I built that and I enjoyed it. We've been out maybe a dozen times in it and, I started saying, well, you know, I want to build something bigger. And so I did start doing the, um, building a, like an off-road, I call it the off-road version of a teardrop trailer. And it was actually a project that a guy started, um, out in Chattanooga and I, I bought the frame from him. Um, cause he, he had to, you know, he was moving and he had to get rid of it. So I bought it from him and I was like, all right, I'm going to continue this on. And, um, and it was just like, right after that, uh, in an unfortunate circumstance, my, my, um, my papa, my grandfather passed away and, um, he left me the RV, um, that you see today. So it's very sentimental to me, this RV. So I'm bringing it home and, 
I mean, it was in pretty rough shape. It was sitting for two, two to three years. You know, it's, you know, completely musk, you know, full of musk and, you know, water damage everywhere. The, you know, the roof was leaking, you know, the whole nine yards and didn't have AC, didn't have all that stuff. So it was like, you know, it was just like immediately I started tackling little projects on that thing. And I mean, I have a list over a thousand things I've done that, you know, that thing, just little things to, to bigger stuff. And it's just been a great, you know, um, you know, memory creator for, you know, my wife and I and, and, and friends. And I just, you know, I love it. It's, it's great, man. We still, we're still doing more and more work to it, you know, and uh, one of the big latest things I've done is we rewrapped the whole outside of it. So I, I created a design um, and a, um, you know, a vector design and I had, I sent it off to a print shop and they printed everything out and I got it all wrapped and um that turned out really good so now we're we're almost done on the outside we you know we put a new roof on it and everything there's some videos of that as well and then um now we're going to tackle the interior we've been painting it we've redone all the like knobs and that kind of stuff redid the flooring um now we got um new furniture coming actually in the next uh, couple months we'll have some new furniture for it so um we'll be putting installing that as well so the rv has just been incredible i mean i think um on average, we try to camp um, roughly uh, one to two times a month. Like, oh, so cool. we're we're pretty we're pretty active in it. Um, not this this time of the year is colder, so we don't typically go as often. But it, we do get out. Um, like I said, in 2020, we I think we took 19 trips, and in 2021, about 18 trips. So we're we we go a lot. Did you notice an influx in more RVing during those times? Absolutely. Yeah, we did. Um, it was it was actually harder and harder to get spots. And one of the things we do, we try to we try to get spots about four months to six months ahead of time, especially if it's a key date, like a, a holiday weekend or something like that. You definitely want to make sure you're um, you're getting your spots early. Okay. I would imagine in the next year or two, you're going to see a lot more. Um, uh, RVs being sold, <laughs> just sitting there because people have like bought them, and then they're just going to be like, "Yeah, this is not what I thought." Having their fun, and now they're done. Yeah, yeah. So, a lot of people like the hotel atmosphere where you just leave and it's a mess, and you don't have to do anything. Yep. Yeah, my 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 wife grew up <clears throat> going in campers, not necessarily RVs, but in you know, going camper and going going in a camper, and mm -hmm. you know, just she would love to get back into doing that, especially now that my oldest with a my grandson lives in Louisiana. It would make life a lot easier to just get up and go. Yeah. yeah and that's one of the things I, I definitely like about it. We keep it most, for the most part stocked so that anytime we need to go, we can go. It's just like you get some food, you get your clean clothes and you rock and roll. Um, hmm. But you know, your, your essentials are always in there. We try to keep it, you know, stocked. So, you know, we have, you know, two, um, um, different you know the utensils and stuff we have doubles of everything we have like two toasters and all that stuff all you know that kind of stuff so that way we're not you know robbing stuff from the rv to you know make stuff work at home and vice versa yeah, yeah. well and you just got married so that makes it easy if you get toasters and blenders and all that <laughs> that's <laughs> right that's right yeah we got we got a couple extra air fryers and stuff we're like oh, i guess we'll just start in the rv why not which so. one do we like best <laughs> exactly yeah, so we can get set up their camper for boondocking out yep. there in Utah. They can camp almost anywhere. That's that's amazing. I, I've I've done some boondocking, um, which I don't know if you guys know, but boondocking is basically you're not connected to power or water, um, so you're fully sufficient. Okay. Um, so boondocking could be running off of solar, or you could be running off of a generator. Uh, but the idea is that you are self sufficient. You're you're not you know doing you're not hooked up to anything. So we've boondocked before on like long trips. We'll go into like an overnight boondock at like Walmart parking lot or something like that. Or say we get to a campsite too early, we'll find like a, a Cabela's or something like that. And you'll boondock in the, in the parking lot until it's open. Um, but that's, I'm sure what Angus is talking about is a lot more, you know, in depth than what I do. Yeah. No, he's, he's, I had no he's idea. probably a little cooler because if he lives in Utah and he's got all these options out there. So, yeah. Yeah, see, he just said he's doing solar. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and that that would be cool. Like I've considered doing solar um, in the uh, in the RV as well. I think I can do roughly a, a, a thousand watts on the on the roof of my my solar or with solar in the roof of my RV. That's pretty good though. Using the solar, I, I think it's interesting that today, for whatever reason, um, in Facebook ads, I had that it, it's a new Jackery unit. 
Yeah. That's mm-hmm. all solar powered. Yeah. And I thought it was a great advertisement because it was like, you know, the, the kids on the, the, there are two campsites and the one guy is having his gas generator and he's pouring the gas and the family's like, oh, it stinks and it's so loud. And the other <laughs> family's having a great time and it's quiet and they're pouring wine. I was like, this is great advertising. That's awesome. But no, it, I didn't think about solar. I mean, really, you could put all of that on top of the RV. Yep. And, yep. And There's a lot of places, a lot of room up there that's just, you know, just roof that you can put solar panels on. And I mean, that that's, that's only part of the equation. You got to have a battery bank to, to do it as well. Right. It's, you know, if you think of solar kind of like, um, you know, like a water and funnel, like if you, you got a thousand Watts of solar and you only have one battery, that's, that's, it's going to recharge that battery really quickly, but you're also going to discharge that battery really quickly. So you have to find that balance of, well, I only need four panels, which is 400 watts roughly, to do four four batteries because I'm only going to go an overnight or, or something like that. So you got to figure out what's what's right for your situation. Um, so if you have a thousand watts and it's you know bright sunlight, you might be able to run all your stuff just off the solar panels without any battery. But as soon as the light, you know, as soon as the sun goes down at night, then you have a problem. So you have to have a battery to to store that energy. Now, what do you do about water? So you, you have tanks. Um, I have a, I have a hundred gallon tank of water on, in my RV. So you would have different, you know, different ones have 40, 60, 80, hundred, probably bigger than that as well. And so you'd, you'd fill it up before you leave. Okay. And then you have, you have, um, so you have a white, uh, I call it a white water tank or a clear water tank, which is that. And then you have, um, a black water tank, which is, you know, for your toilet and stuff. And then you have a gray water tank, which is like you washing your hands in the sink and that kind of stuff. So it's it, it principally could be reused for something that's going to be like that, or what's the you couldn't re, difference? well typically you would um, you would dump that in a dumping station so you can pull like there's dumping stations you know usually on the side of the road like um, um, some of the um, what do you call them like you know you pull over on the highway to go to the bathroom and stuff they have dumping rest stations. area yeah like rest areas they have oh, dumping okay. stations <laughs> yeah that's what they're and, called that's right. And some people, and some people, they you can actually they have them so that they can they can take the tank out and they can go into the rest room and themselves and dump it. You know, that's just part. That's the dirty side of RVing. Unfortunately, you got to take your stuff with you. <laughs> you know? Yeah, you got to slosh that around. Not it's down sloshing the road. around. It's yeah, it's the dirty side of things. So, and you can you can come up with rules that make sense for you and your family and friends, right? So it's, but that's make it work for you. Yeah. Yeah, there you go. You could always just do the old outhouse. Yeah. Dig a hole. I mean, you got a hitch on the back of the RV. You just have a trailer with an outhouse on it, you know? <laughs> I was wondering, like, could you put a trailer with water on it? You could. Like, to white? Okay. Yeah. I mean, see, this is all, I have zero idea. I know what it looks like. I've been on top of an RV. The only mm-hmm. time I ever thought of an RV was at like a NASCAR race. Yeah. You know, they all park in the infield. They camp mm-hmm. out for a week and uh, mm-hmm. that kind of thing. I don't. You know, it wasn't until you came to the extravaganza that you were looking for a local place that, like, I didn't realize there was this much of a community to RVing. Like, it's huge. Oh, it's, it's huge. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's really cool stuff, man. Like, it's, you know, they can take space, you know, these little tiny areas in a, in a, you know, in the bedroom or something. And now that's a hot water tank or something for your, you know, for your whole RV. It's just, it's such cool, like, you know, thinking out outside of the box with a lot of the stuff and organization, everything is, it's really cool in an RV. And mine's, mine's a 1999 Fleetwood Bounder and it's, the Bounders are very common. I mean, when I'm driving down the road, I see them all the time. It's probably one of the most popular sold ones. And it's, um, it's, it's easy to find parts if there's something, or you can find aftermarket stuff that people have made work as well. Um, and I have a generator on board on mine and I have those tanks. So I can technically boondock like Angus does, but mine's just not solar at this time. Okay. That's next on the list. Yeah, it's a, it's a thought. I just, I don't think we do it enough to make it worth our while. Um, but it might be something to consider. Just get you set, just get you an exercise bike and run some cables to, you, uh, you know, to the battery yeah. and just make yeah, absolutely. power. Absolutely. Yeah. The stinky slinky. Yeah. That's the dirty side of it. It is. Is that what they call that in Utah? <laughs> <laughs> Don't get them started. Yeah. I've even pulled the teardrop behind my RV. So if we needed extra, you know, we we can, we can about six people in the RV uh, fairly comfortably. But if we had more than that, we could, uh, we bring the teardrop with us so you can have two other people. So the, the, 
the RV can pull, you know, the, um, I've, I've pulled the motorcycle, I've pulled the side by side and I've pulled the, um, you know, the, the teardrop as well. Cool. Oh, there you go. How about, uh, Chris, you buy one and then, uh, Scott and Mike will go on the road with the whatnot podcast and Scott. Hmm. Wait a minute, I've seen, I've seen some fun videos on YouTube where people buy a $500 Winnebago and drive across country. Those are always fun. Yeah. Cause you never know what you're getting into with that. No. No. Seems like something off of uh, the old top here. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Got to get inspiration somewhere. Yep. And I mean, if you got some, you know, some mechanical knowledge, you'll, you can figure it out. And tools, you know, tools would help. You, got, you need, you need a lot of tools. You're our, so the, yeah, the other part of RVing is you're always fixing something. It just, it's just part of it. Well, it's like it's, bringing a house with you, right? It's bringing a house. And you got to think too, when you're driving down a road, you're going through like earthquake you know, move maneuvers, you know, on a house and that whole thing's racking and, you know, squeaking and everything else, you know, you got wind and, you know, the, the fluctuation of temperature causing expansion and contraction. And there's so much that happens to an RV. And if you're not using it a lot, like it's, it just sits there and becomes, you know, even more broken. Just add to the list at that. Just point. add it to the list. Yeah. Like I have these leveling blocks or these leveling jacks on mine and the jacks, um, I I've had them open for so long. They actually broke the spring. So it's like the spring tension, you know, it just, it, it just snapped. Hmm. So I had to crawl underneath there and replace the spring. So I luckily I, I found that one. Yeah. Luckily I found, I found one. So no big deal. Hey, you've had some pretty good, uh, you know, I don't, I don't do RVing, but I've watched a few of your videos where you've had some pretty cool tips on, certain things that uh, you got to do maintenance on and how to get to it. And, you know, I think it's probably, I don't know, six, eight, nine months ago or something. You Maybe even a year you did something on that. And I was like, huh, I'm going to watch this, even though I don't have an RV, just uh, in case <laughs> I ever get one. <laughs> I remember, I remember he told me. No, uh, you know, I try to, if I find something that I don't think is um, readily accessible, like already on YouTube, I'll, I'll, you know, I like to tell my story and try to help somebody. Mm -hmm. And I, and I think one of the ones that happened, like you were saying is I fixed the hot water tank in the, in my RV. And I kind of talked through the, you know, what I went through to try to figure out what was wrong with it. And I, all the stuff I bought that I actually didn't need, you know, during this process. Um, and just kind of put that all in a video and it's one of my more popular videos, actually. I was thinking there was a post I saw somewhere and this was a while ago that you were talking to another RV group and it seemed like everyone in the group was actually pretty helpful with the situation as far as what they ran into. And that's why you had this part and stuff mm -hmm. along those lines. So you, have you had any bad experiences in the RV community as far as someone, you know, not giving the information or, you know, saying, Oh, great. You're a beginner or something like that. I mean, it seemed pretty uh, supportive to me. No, I haven't. Uh, as far as groups are concerned, I haven't. Um, the, the only challenging thing I've seen with the RV world is if you, if you're not able to fix it yourself, they, you'll be waiting a long time. Like, you know, if you go to a local RV shop, um, the, their backlog is just, you know, six months out typically. Um, or if you have to hire somebody to come to your house to work on it, that's, that's big money. Mm -hmm. So if you're going to get into RVing, like, you know, know, you know, know that you're going to be trying to tackle stuff yourself. That that's the best way to handle it. So there you go, Chris. That's what you got to look forward to mm -hmm. fixing stuff on the road. Yep. And, and the number, house. and the number one thing is water damage. When you buy, when you buy an RV, look for water damage. Yeah, because a lot of roofs, a lot of roofs will um, crack or like a, a stick or a, a branch will fall on the roof and, you know, put a hole in the, the membrane and next and nobody sees it. So it's just sitting there out in the rain for, you know, three seasons because they're not using it often enough and it's just leaking. So is that why I see a lot of RVs with their own little carport? Yep. And you'll see a lot of RVs with tarps on top. <laughs> and that's why. <laughs> yep. We just bought, I, I actually have some videos of it now. It's not, not RV, but we bought a camper recently. I don't know if you've seen some of those videos and the whole slide out was rotted. And that's, that's what happened when they closed the slide out, when they stored it, they've been storing it for two and a half years. When they closed the slide out, there was a stick in, in the slide out that kept the seal open. So every time it rained, water would just go in and go down on the floor. The whole floor was rotted. Like I oh. stepped on it with my foot and it just went right through it. Hmm. Was that the trap door one? 
It, no, it's it, yeah. Well, it's it, it's like a trap door. <laughs> we had to replace the whole floor. Like it was, it's rough, but um, it's really coming along. Um, my cousin and I have been working on it together. He's been doing a lot more work than me, but um, I've been filming the process, and I'll put some, you know, put some edits here soon, and put them up on the channel. What's the channel name? Southern Ginger Workshop. You didn't have a separate one for the RV? No. So that's okay. You did have one separate for the off-road. For the off-roading. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's um, Southern off-road. Uh, Southern camping and off-road. So. Yeah. Chris says RV shops around here don't pay their repairmen that much, but about 10 bucks an hour, which is why it's so long for the weight, I'm guessing. That's interesting. Yeah. I, I hate that that's a, only 10 bucks an hour. That's crazy. They figure they're just going to business for themselves at that point. Just go around to RV. I mean, parks yeah. If you're a mo if you have the tools and you if you have a truck that you can, you know, are mobile, like there's big money in that. Like when I went to go get my my roof, I was gonna get redo my I was gonna have somebody redo my roof before I didn't decide to do it myself. Um, the guy wanted forty five hundred bucks. I mean, that's that's, that's big some money. Serious cash, yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I ended up doing it myself for fifteen hundred. So, you know, and it's a 50 year warranty. The stuff I did, it's a, it's a silicone membrane. So. So let's see here. So, um, RVing off-roading. So with the off-road, you have a pretty nice toy. Mm -hmm. What is it? <laughs> it's, it's a Polaris razor. It's pretty common here on the East side, East coast. Um, people, um, they run the razors. Ninety percent of the people that I know run razors out in this area. They're not. I don't think they're as common out in Utah. There's, um, you know, there are razors out there, but I think some of the other ones, like Candams, that kind of stuff, uh, rule that area. But um, the uh, mine's a 2017 Polaris razor. It's got a um, a full cage, a bouncer cage on it. I bought it that way. I bought it used because um, it was one of those things where. You know, I had some friends that have it and I just didn't know how often I was going to go out. So I didn't want to, you know, go all in because these things can get very expensive. Um, mm -hmm. Like a standard razor, you know, starts about 15 grand, you know, just for a razor. And it's like just a toy that you're going to just go, you know, beat up in the woods, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so and I, I have friends that have spent well over 30,000 on theirs, you know, it's because because it's just one of those things they enjoy so much. And, you know, I don't think that's a problem if it's something you use often, you know, and it's something yeah. you're creating memories with. Um, so I, I use mine a lot the first couple of years. This past year, unfortunately, I've only used it like three or four times. Um, but uh, it is definitely something I enjoy when I do get out to, to ride it. And, um, you know, if you think of it, it's, it's a side by side. It's basically like a, you know, a, a glorified Jeep with an incredible suspension. So you can. I mean, the thing's got 24 inches of suspension travel and like 16 inches of um, ground clearance. So you, I mean, it, you can basically drive over anything. Like it's, it's, it's incredible. Um, but uh, yeah, the only thing that the Jeep has on it really is that it's uh, you know, Jeep, you can drive on the road and you know, you can't drive a side by side on the road, unfortunately, but you can trailer it. You can trailer it behind yep. the Jeep that can drive on the road. Yep. Yeah, Brian. Yeah, Brian's a good friend of mine. He's uh, he he goes out riding with me too, or I go out riding with him. However it's just money. He, it's just money. Just, it's just money. He loves Baja. He likes going out in Baja. There is something. There's something fun about Baja. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Sand dunes in Arizona. Well, I'll say California technically, but and then when I lived in Arizona, going out to the dunes and just yeah. ripping it wide open. There's something really crazy about that. Yeah, that's what he does out. And I think out in Cali on the beach, he'll run the Baja on that. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I'm saying. Angus is the same thing, right? It's thirty thousand dollars for a toy, and it's again, it's a lot of money. But if you if it's something you enjoy, <laughs> you would you know, and you you get a lot of I call memories out of it. Like, then I think it's worth it. Yeah, I mean, it's like anyone who buys a Harley or gets that motorcycle. Yep. You know, they're going to be dropping some big coin on right. that, and at the same time, they're going out every weekend as much as right. they can and riding it. Same idea. I get yeah. it. Yeah, I mean, I know people that have spent fifty thousand dollars on a teardrop trailer. And you're like, it's a teardrop trailer. You can buy a, you know, an RV like mine for 20 grand, like my, my big RV, yeah. but it's, it's just, they just love the teardrop world. It's, it's, you know, there's just part of it. Yeah. I it's noticed. Kind of like those crazy festival people. They just, they just love those, festivals. So that's <laughs> exactly, all they're going to buy. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Not like those Axiom guys. No, not at all. No, <laughs> no not all those guys. <laughs> so is that a good segue into Axiom? Yeah, we can talk about Axiom. Sure. 
Okay. I know you guys have some some uh, stuff about Axiom as well. Yeah, Chris does. Uh, he went through a couple of CNC machines before he landed on his Pro. Yeah, tell me about it, Chris. I'm curious. Well, I've got a Axiom Elite right there behind me. Mm -hmm. The 8, love it. I don't have all the fancy gadgets like you do with a laser and fourth axis and all that good stuff. But what did you have before? I uh, started with a Shark HD520, the their biggest model, okay. and realized real quick that it wasn't enough for what I needed to do. So stepped up to the AR8 Pro. Gotcha. And yeah, I'd so probably still be running that if I didn't need more ground clearance. Gotcha. Yeah, I have the AR8 as well. Um, mine, I, I don't know if mine was considered a pro when I got it. it I've had it for five or so years now. It's. it's I think you would probably be on the version four, maybe. Maybe. Because you um, have like the gray side panels. Yeah, it's gray. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so you had the version four. Yeah. Uh, and then I think they came out with a pro and the pro plus. Um, mm -hmm. And I actually sent my machine back or the, you know, the, the um, computer back and they upgraded it for me to handle those other, you know, the fourth axis and the laser and that kind of stuff. So, um, cause that my, my machine didn't, it would handle it, but it wasn't like, it wasn't, the plug wasn't ready for me to, you know, just to plug it in like the, the plus has already had in place. Mm -hmm. So, but yeah, I've, I use mine all the time. I still, I mean, I just used it the other day, actually, like, you know, just doing stuff, just little stuff, right. Stuff like this, like it's, um, this was supposed to be like, um, American flag. And I was just going to do like the Punisher logo, you know, with American flag. And, um, I do laser work on it all the time, especially big format laser stuff. Um, I use that laser a lot. Um, and then I recently actually got a laser, uh, like a Glowforge uh, laser for smaller stuff. And I just like it a little bit, you know, a little bit in a, in a different way. It's, it's, you know, it's great, but it's got, there's some stuff that I don't necessarily like on the Glowforge. I like more on the Axiom and then vice mm -hmm. versa. So, um, for instance, like on the Axiom, um, everything is super precise. You know this, Chris, it's super precise. Like you can do, like, if I have to repeat something over and over and over again, like if I didn't cut something deep enough or I need to go back mm -hmm. and cut it again, you just change your Z, you know, and then you can cut it again. Um, you know, and that's, that's really handy. Or if I say, say somebody sends me something that's, you know, circular or an odd shape, and I need to make sure I'm, I'm doing it dead center when I go to laser, laser it out or put a pocket on it. I would do that on the CNC because I know it's precise. Um, when the glow on the glow forge, it's kind of like, nah, it's close enough. <laughs> like you can't do anything that's like dead set perfect on the glow, on the glow forge, unless the glow forge is, oh, excuse me, is also cutting the shape out mm -hmm. that's the only time you're going to make sure it's perfect every time so like for instance i have i did i did this today actually on the glowforge um but it's really hard it's actually not focused because of the <laughs> the background thing um it's it was really hard to center it on the glowforge it was more of a just like hey let me just guess that that's center right yeah. and hope that it's close enough that the you know the human eye is not like oh yeah that's that's off right um so i did that earlier so but, but the benefits of having a glow forge that you like over having the cnc laser attachment would be small items yeah you can do yeah much smaller stuff like um yeah that's actually a really good segue like if i i did this recently on the on the glow forge again it's not focused great but um these little tiny like inlets on this thing, they are they they would be really hard to do like on a CNC with a with a CNC bit, right? Because of the you know the rounded shape of the bit, you could get down to you know a one sixteenth um, or something like that bit to cut that stuff. But I like it better on the laser. It just looks like crisper on the laser. And you can get really really tight detail. Yeah, and um, the shadow lines are better coming off the laser too, so it adds to the to the yeah. visual effect that you get. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So what software do you all use for design and running your machines? Chris would like to know. Yep, yep. So I am, I'm probably a little bit different than a lot of folks. I, I'm a big fan of Affinity, um, Affinity Designer. Um, I use all of their products. Um, and I, I start there with all of, I build my vector designs in Affinity, and then I'll bring it into VCarve Pro if I need to do it for the CNC. 
or I can just export right out of Affinity um, into um, Glowforge's app and then use it that way. So that's that's mostly what I do. I usually do it in, in that. I have I have also do stuff in um, Fusion 360, but for the most part, it's 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 Affinity. Okay. Yeah, I've tried um, I've tried SketchUp. Don't like it. I I, oh, I do others. use SketchUp, but I don't use SketchUp for CNC work. I do SketchUp for modeling out stuff that I want to maybe do around the house. Like I just modeled a um, a new deck for the back of the house. So it's one of the things I want to take on this um, this year is you know, building a deck off the, off the back. Hmm. Well, this is interesting here. Kyle says yep. that for centering stuff on the laser, he puts a piece of scrap down. Then you'll do a small score line the same as the shape you're trying to engrave. Um, then place the part on the score line and be perfectly centered. Yep. Yep. That's one way to do it for sure. Mm-hmm. Cause you don't on, on, on Glowforge, there's no such thing as like an origin. Like, mm-hmm. you know, when you're in V-Carve, you can do, you know, left, top, bottom, center, you know, that kind of stuff. You can't do that in, in Glowforge's software. She's looking, okay, so Angus is looking for a CAD, for mm-hmm. a CAD for his daughter, wants to get into computer modeling, has mm-hmm. a 3D printer, and wants to design mm-hmm. her own stuff. Any suggestions? Yeah, so for 3D printer stuff and getting into CAD work, um, Fusion 360 would be a good one because you can actually go straight out of Fusion 360 into... Um, your 3D printing stuff, which I have a 3D printer right here. Um, you'll export directly into, um, what is it, uh, uh, Cura you know, or whatever software you choose, but you can directly into Cura and then you can just print it right out. Yep. Yep. Just like Chris said, Fusion 360. Yeah. Yeah. It's, I, found, I found Fusion 360 to be a little bit easier for me to understand mm-hmm. and operate. I'm, I still suck at it, but, you know, I want to learn it because if as a cabinet guy, I, I don't make plans. I do everything drawn out by hand, still old mm-hmm. school. So mm-hmm. I really want to learn that. Yeah, it's a it's a bit of a steep learning curve, um, I would admit, um, trying to get into Fusion 360. But if if your daughter can pick that up um, and start doing 3D modeling out of that, that's, that's a really cool software. The other one is Blender. People use Blender for that stuff too. Mm-hmm. Both of them are technically free. I only use a Blender for my food. <laughs> say, for mixed drinks yeah i wasn't gonna say that but okay uh, what does that say om te- tech yeah om tech i wasn't quite sure we will okay okay yeah so yeah kyle's getting fancy he's putting up fences and alignment tools on his yeah okay kyle kyle's done some pretty hardcore stuff uh <clears throat> in his day job before what he does now which is nice. just the uh LearnYourCNC.com. No plug intended. Completely not sponsored, but we love you. Love it. And Kyle's not afraid to spend money on good stuff either. <clears throat> yeah, I'm. I'm in. Uh, I'm in awe and envy of his little tripod on his desk. <laughs> the um, yeah, one of the things that I, I mean, with the Glowforge stuff, like the the way that the 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 bottom plate, um, the sacrificial like. Um, mesh or whatever you want to call it that you put the the wood on to cut in um that is is actually like um uh, magneted on there and i'm afraid that it's not going to be perfect every time you you lift that off and put it back down and the magnets don't center itself so that's why i haven't i've I've been trying to think of ways to build like a nice uh, fence system maybe just like a top left corner or something like that um, but I haven't, I haven't found a really good way of doing it yet. Um, there are some stuff on Thingiverse actually that you can use for your Glowforge to make um, like a um, at origins essentially um, that you can print on your three D printer. So a nice, nice, uh, you know, use your three D printer to, to fix your laser. <laughs> Let's see, Chris says he would love to learn the parametric modeling aspect of three D modeling software. Kyle says that it's a tax write-offs, Chris. Yep. Speaking of tax write-offs, though, if you have a chance, you can always support us at patreon.com slash whatnot podcast. And I'm pretty it. sure there's a tax bracket something right off for that. Nice. Well, just like me, I put Southern Ginger on the back of my RV. You know, it's tax write-off, right? Advertisement. Advertisement. Marketing. <laughs> we that do come want right to... out of your marketing fund? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> oh wait, sorry. Actually, I think one of the the yes. one of the first videos I remember seeing of yours was 
where you were show, showing the, uh, I can't remember if it was the actual Axiom install or if it was the one where you did the, uh, where you showed how to, how to dial in the puck oh, okay. in, in sure. the controller. I think, I think that was actually what I saw first. And then your, your main Axiom install, a single gotcha. install video. Yeah. You know, it's like silly stuff. Those are some silly ones. I was like, you know, this could be helpful for somebody. Um, I did another one for Axiom where, you know, showing you how to make your own thumb drive. I hear it all the time on, like, I actually run another group for Axiom owners on, on Facebook as well. And that, you know, they, the question comes up a lot. is like, oh, I lost my thumb drive. How do I, you know, create another one? So I'm like, here's my video. <laughs> like, it shows you how to create one. So. I think actually one of the coolest videos I saw uh, for one of their products was the one you did on the, the uh, Stratus. Oh, the okay. the lighting you used in that video was just yeah. the way you showcased how that was pulling the dust in. Yeah, that was uh, that was a really good cinematic effect. Appreciate it. Yeah, I had to find a way to show the dust. Like, how do you show people in a room like a wide angle shot? Like, hey, this pulls dust in. You know. Mm-hmm. So I was trying to figure out the best way to do that, and I used MDF to do that, of course, because MDF makes a whole bunch of dust. Nice dust too, loft dust and heavy dust. So yeah. that works out really well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now I use that all the time still. So Scott, Tries. there isn't a minimum necessarily. You can always buy Chris a burger if you'd like. <laughs> uh, but head on over to uh, Patreon.com, whatnot podcast, to see all of the <laughs> tiers and brackets that we have available for you. And if there's not one, and you want to see one that's different. Messages. We'll be happy to create another <laughs> tier just for you. <laughs> That's right. That's awesome. Is there a God, tier where we get a free T-shirt? Or sure, whenever we make T-shirts. I already told, <laughs> I already told John and Michelle they get a T-shirt because they're the okay. first ones, and we appreciate okay. it. You know, we should just go ahead and create a design and whatnoters and be done with it. Yeah. So, so those who are, so you know, Zach, those who are diehard with us every week they have dubbed themselves mm-hmm. whatnotters mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then we like to always do the whatnotta whatnotta so therefore actually we should do that southern ones are whatnotters and northerns are whatnottas <laughs> i like it we could put one on the front and one on the back there you go which one are you but anyway <laughs> which one are you? We'll yeah, i used to do t-shirt design um one of my previous careers is there anything you don't do? Um, he doesn't do a I, podcast. I don't do a podcast. <laughs> I've considered it, but I, I, you know, it's one of those things where it's it's a lot of work that you guys do coming up with ideas every week and getting people, you know, scheduled and all that stuff. It's it's tough. Well, that's yeah, why we Chris, bring different people on. That way, it makes it easier. You don't have to come up with an agenda. You just <laughs> you just go with it. Yeah. yeah. Who are we going to have? Oh, we're going to talk woodworking tonight with Zach. Uh, have we talked any woodworking? No, we've talked travel trailers. <laughs> <laughs> there was some. I tried to throw it in there because, you know, it is technically a woodworking podcast. But, hey, we all get into different things. <clears throat> well, it's like yeah, I just grew a couple weeks ago. We, we brought her on to talk epoxy. And I don't think we talked about epoxy at all. <laughs> That's hilarious. We did bring up the fact that she had her own epoxy line with Total. That's pretty that cool. That was about yeah. it. That's yeah. pretty cool. Yeah. yeah Good job went, on Jess on that one. Yeah, we, we had actually that one went down a road that was probably a topic that needed to be covered. So it just happened. We'll go nice. with it. Nice. That's the best part about, you know, having podcasts and, you know, um, and having interview style podcasts where you never know what's going to happen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And that Especially that's the other thing we've run into. Well, Chris has run into. I don't do the scheduling stuff. I, he, he, he volunteered. I was like, yes, please. Absolutely. <laughs> Um, but people thinking it's like an interview and really it's just more of like, tell us who you are, what's going on, what you're into. And then we can just start rolling from there, which is great. Sure. sure. You know, we yeah. thought we were going to have the reunion group on last week and uh turns out it was just comedy hour and a half oh, with uh, <laughs> Joel trying to figure out his audio issues. There, right? <clears throat> yeah. I heard it was uh skipping. Oh, it was Max Hedrum all day long. That's that awesome. Great. <laughs> yeah. I want some beer and popcorn. What's yeah, going on? Wednesday night beer and popcorn. No, it's cool that you guys are putting this together. I like it. Yeah. It was it was one of those things where we always talked about it. And then finally, since, uh, what, 21, mm-hmm. it was like, all right, let's just do it. And so, yeah, early episodes, horrible but fun. Horrible. So our That's my favorite thing that we do without a guest, though, by far, is the Wheel of Misfortune. That's still my favorite thing. Oh, yeah? 
Yeah, we bring up topics that are both um, politically incorrect, you know, hot buttons for today, but we have to tie them back into woodworking. Oh, okay. All right. I like yeah. that. And we don't we don't select them. We spin a wheel, and if it lands on it, that's what we have to talk about. And you do that with with uh, with guests or no? No, we just did it with just ourselves as something oh, okay. we, we read out of topics. <laughs> it, it was right after that we decided we needed to bring on a guest. We gotta <laughs> we gotta find some kind of way to regulate this sucker because this, this could go downhill quickly before it ever like gets it. started. We'll like never it. have sponsorships awesome. if we keep doing Wheel of Misfortune. <clears throat> no, that's cool, man. Yeah, I um I guess to add a little bit to the woodworking, since you know it is a woodworking podcast, as you said. Um you know, my calories. Technicalities. I mean, my my career. Um, I have a nine to five. That I'm I'm a software developer. So a lot of my, you know, stuff in the woodworking world has always been kind of you know engineer minded. I guess in a sense. So there's picking up the CNC, picking up laser work, um, that kind of stuff. That really just kind of um, you know helped cement me into the woodworking um, and give me to to be able to like design stuff on the computer and then seeing it in physical space. It's just really cool connection between that. And that's what I really enjoyed about it. And I, a lot of the stuff that I like to do is not, um, you know, I do some of the more typical stuff like signage and the stuff where somebody's like, Hey, I got a birthday coming up or I got a wedding coming up. Can you do this? And I'm like, yeah, sure. But I enjoy stuff that's, you know, unique that I have to make 400 of something, you know, it's like beer taps or, um, you know, beer flight holders or something like that. I really enjoy those kind of things um, where it's, you know, I have to come up with a way that, you know, we could effectively make 50 beer taps at a time, you know, and have like a grid build out like a template or, a, you know, a fixture that allows me to do that. And those are the kind of things I like. So production design. Yeah. 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 Um, the other, uh, not too long ago, actually on the laser machine, the, the Glowforge, you know, I made like 200 uh, magnets for a wedding. The guy wanted to give away like magnets to everybody so they could throw on their refrigerator, remember their date, that kind of thing. And I enjoyed that because I was like, yeah, cool. I'll do that. And we made it out of cherry plywood, which was really cool looking, you know. So, um, you know, it's just stuff like that. I really enjoy those those kind of those projects the most because it, I can design it. Or some of these guys that reach out to me um, are actually designers already because uh, I, you know, I, I had my career like does a little bit in the graph design world as well. So when they, they reach out and say, hey, well, I can do the design work if you could just make it happen in, in the woodworking side. And that's, I enjoy that too. That's cool. So that's, that's typically what I like to excel in is those kind of things. So if he does graphic design, maybe what we ought to do is put up a reverse auction between him and JP on who gets to design our uh, shirt <laughs> and the lowest bid wins. <laughs> there you go. There you go. I like it. Or what, just let the whatnotters decide which one they like better. There you go. Then the no, JP, gets five bucks. JP and I go back and forth with design stuff. Um, he and I worked on some animations for the uh, Southern Ginger, the, the um, Southern Camping and Off-Road intros and that kind of stuff. He does really nice intros mm -hmm. for sure. Yep. Uh, let's see. Scott Houston asked the question that we do try to ask every guest, and that is Team Chamfer or Team Roundover? Oh. Chris, sorry. Scott asked the question. It wasn't me this time. Interesting. He should just mind his business. <laughs> I feel I feel cornered. Don't, uh, you don't have cornered. to be because uh, I'm the only team. I'm the only one in one of those corners, so it really doesn't matter <laughs> yeah. which way you go. Um well if it's CNC work, it's Team Chamfer because I can do that with a with a V bit before I cut it out. And it's well, what about and regular it's woodworking? We're not talking CNC tonight. We're talking regular woodworking. Oh, he can I'm give any he wants to. I don't Shut do woodwork. I don't do woodworking. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's right. I was gonna say it's all right because uh, JP does uh team OG. OG? Yep, OG. I, uh, tinted corner. Tinted corner. There you go. All right. That'll work. Drip, drip edge. Yeah. All right. Um, no, it, it actually depends. I, I actually, if I'm trying to do a design that I just want to add a little bit of flavor to the edge, sometimes I'll do, um, I won't do, I'll do a, um, like a 90 degree corner and then I'll do just inside like an eighth of an inch. I'll do a nice little, um, like groove in it or something like that, just to give it a little bit of flair. Um, but I use them both roundovers. I, 
I don't use as often. I use if I'm doing a round out, typically I would do like a sand. I would do sanding. I would just like sand the edge to break the edge off. That's called a round over. Yeah, well, but it's it's, but it's not using edge. a round over. Bit, but I'm not using the edge over. is still a round over. <laughs> if you're sanding flat panels, you're rounding the edge just a little bit. That's called a round over. Okay, well then, then I'm round. <laughs> when I'm sanding, it's round over. Listen, that's with my clean, I have, my I have to, I have to find anything go. possible to get a win. That's all I'm just saying. Hundred percent, not sponsored. <laughs> Like this is not this doesn't even have a round. Look, that's flat. That's terrible. Make the dented edge. Give it a little flare. Yeah. Don't cut yourself on that sharp edge. Maybe you should take some sandpaper and ease it over. <laughs> ease it over a little bit. Ease it over. There you go. <laughs> I like it. Oh, let me ask you this. This is I always thought it was strange how my dad put this term and maybe it's normal and I just thought it was crazy. But if you're doing molding, crown molding, and you're doing a miter. And they're not exact. Okay. Mm -hmm. What do you call it when you go to kind of sand them or burnish them together? What is the term that you guys would use to make them match up? Like, I mean, they're off by a hair. They're not, it's not a huge gap. Or one's more proud than the other one. What would you call it to, uh, to clean that up and make it look right? Let us know in the comments below. <laughs> I was going to say, like, what I would call you it call ro it? rolling the edge. Rolling the edge? Or burnishing, because essentially you're doing just that. You're kind of burnishing it with a tool to create that. So, well, because Chris knows my dad. He he works with Persuading, him on some seats. Persuading so. the edge. Team, Team to corner. The corner. Yeah. That too. Now, do you, that's a good question. Do you like to do the, you know, a typical 45 or any type of miter? Or do you actually cut it with the molding itself? The actual, like, coping, like do a coping, coping saw it? on it? Mm-hmm. I guess it depends on the situation, kind of like the team chamfer, team roundover thing, because this one here would be where it sticks out. It's it's proud, and you're meeting two pieces together. So whether it's a compound miter or it's just like oh, a 45, sure. it's when one piece, it's like you're up on the ladder, and it's mm -hmm. right there, and it's close. And you're like, you know what? We can make this work. So Yeah, the, I've I've used the edge of a, um, a screwdriver to fix that before, where I just rolled that edge. Yeah, so that's the burnishing property and that's exactly what gotcha. i would always do is just push push the yeah. one that's proud into the one that's not it's sure. like yeah it looks good from where i'm yeah. down here on the ladder yeah it looks, it looks great yeah, so yeah i've used a nail set house. for that because typically a nail sets in the pouch when i'm up there putting up oh yeah nail so. Set. Sure. yeah same so, thing so here's yeah. the funny thing the term that he would call that relishing it relishing it relishing the edge okay and anytime i bring that up to somebody because it, it came up today in a conversation at work um, with a customer that, you know, just relish it. And he's like, what, what, what condiments? I was like, Oh, maybe that's not a normal thing. So leave it in the comments. I, I catch up the corner. Catch up the corner. <laughs> Caulk and paint covers yep. everything except for gaps. Don't ever be fooled. <laughs> Burnish up to a quarter inch. Yeah. Okay. That's, are you just beating it with a hammer? Right? <laughs> yeah, you're persuading it now. You're persuading it. That's a good way to put it. Yep. Uh, use a framing nailer to put crown up. And yeah, just let it split. Who cares? <laughs> just let it split. <laughs> <laughs> 16 gauge. You just yeah, gonna, yeah. Why not? There's a lot of putty in his toolbox. <laughs> How do you set a roofing nail? Very Let's find well, out. Crown <laughs> I mean, you can. Awesome so any, stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, we uh, covered anything and everything, I think. Maybe. I mean, basically, RVs to 3D printers there for a short second. I mean, mm -hmm. we, the only thing we didn't really cover was metal grinding, you know, and, and stuff. But you did say you opened a shop to be able to do some of that if needed. Mm -hmm. So, you know, maybe we'll have you on when you start doing metal work, and we'll uh, see how that's coming out. Yeah, I started um, just, uh, you know, the idea here was that I would – um, I had some of that stuff in my woodworking shop already. Uh, like I have grinders and powder coating machine and all that kind of stuff. And it was just kind of crowding the woodworking stuff. So decided to create another shop. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a garage, it, mm -hmm. but I've made it into a shop. Um, so what 24 by 36 by 12 foot tall ceilings. Cause I wanted to be able to put a car lift in there. So I have a car lift on the way as well. 
So I'll be able to pull my my Jeep or my side by side or something like that in there, be able to race it up, actually walk underneath it, change the oil, whatever I need to do. Um, I'm getting too old to lay on my back. So I decided to get me a lift. Um, so yeah, um, got that finished. Uh, I started that project about a year and a half ago. And I'm still waiting for the garage door. So as of now, I've heard next week, they're supposed to be here to install the garage door. So it's been sitting there for a year and a half without a garage door. So that's always been fun. Nice. Um, yeah. So once that's done, I've already done electrical work in there. I put all the lights in there, put about 30 plugs in there. I moved my air compressor up there and you know wired that all in. Um, so I've gotten all that done. And yeah, once the, um, the garage door gets on there, I'll start moving some of my other stuff up there. That's, you know, like my tools and stuff. I don't want that kind of stuff stolen. So I'm just oh, yeah. going to leave that in my shop until it's available. Yeah, I like the little station you made uh, in your garage with the uh, with the little wall control for your mm -hmm. razor. That yep. was a cool little station you put together for that. Yep. I liked how you laid that out in the design part. So appreciate it. Yeah, I'm actually going to be moving that over to the new shop as well because um, that garage in there that's going to end up being that's the one that's connected to the house that'll be for my wife and um, I'll actually end up putting the teardrop in there as well because um, I I don't leave the teardrop outside. It's always been in the garage since I built it. So. I'll move that over there. Then the Jeep will go into the main, the big garage. So I'm going to start getting into more mechanical stuff. Um, like I just, I just worked on the transmission on the RV the other day. Um, so I'm starting to get into, you know, more of that world as well. I watch a lot of like um, off-road builder, like building cars or building trucks or whatever, off-roading Jeeps and stuff. Um, so I'm, I'm starting to get into that world a little bit more now. So is the, would you consider the off-road teardrop? Is it going to be in the future? I want, I really do want to finish it, to be honest with you. I've, I've been trying my best to find a reason to finish it. And that's been my challenge because I have like, if I'm going to go on a long trip, I'm taking the RV. If I'm going on a short trip and off-roading, then I'm taking a tent. If I'm taking a short trip with no off-roading, then I'm taking the side by side or the, um, the teardrop. So it's like, I haven't found a real reason to to finish the the big one um, other than the fact of just finishing it to say it's done, you know. So I would be I would be finishing it to sell it essentially, and I I just haven't found a real reason to do that. Well, it would be great for those medium trips that aren't quite long enough for the full RV, but yet right. a little too long for the normal. You know. <laughs> Teardrop. So first so world problems, much, right? Yeah, I mean, you figure out what region of the country would be the ideal area for that off road, and and that's yeah. the one you'd use it for. Well, so like I've I've also considered um, creating a overnight toy hauler is what I would call it. Um, so if I wanted to go off roading, um, but just didn't want to set up a tent, then I would just I could take um, a tear. Think of it as a teardrop on the front of the trailer, and then the back of it is a place to park the side by side. So it's a, it's a bigger trailer, like a 20 to, 20 to 22 foot trailer. And then the front part is, you know, the sleeping quarters and the, the back would be for the teardrop. Or, I'm sorry, for the side by side. So that was that was kind of a thought I had um, was to buy another trailer and then cut cut the um, the floor out of this one and move it the move it to the new trailer. I've considered that as well. And that has some merit to it because then I can actually still use it. So I'm going to, I'm going to load up the picture of it because I really have to say this was one of those, I'm going to take an analog sketch pad and then incorporate a digital Microsoft paint onto <laughs> it. So people have an idea of what yep. I'm talking That's about. That's exactly what I'm talking about. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So the front of this drawing here is the existing um, frame of the off-road teardrop that I started. And the back of it is what I was thinking. If I built it as a ramp that I could drive the, the red thing, it looks the like toy. A, the, the toy on it. Um, I would have a way of strapping it down and still be able to haul it around. So that, that that's got a little bit of merit to it. I've been considering that. But, so all I see with that picture is evil Knievel ginger style. That's right. We, if you hit it fast enough, you can jump right over the, <laughs> the front of the trailer. Tickets are only five dollars to see Zach jump the teardrop toy hauler <laughs> with the side by side. With the side by side. Yep. So I'm thinking when you were bringing up the um, the off road version of the teardrop, you got the Jeep and everything. What about an Overland edition? 
would that be enough excuse to kind of so, build it? Because that's a popular culture too. It is. It is. And I've considered that as well. The, the only problem I have with the overlanding, if using for overlanding, it's, it's too big. Overlanding okay. stuff is smaller, much smaller. Usually um, you'll do like a four foot by four foot trailer on an overland build. And then you would have on top of it, like a rooftop tent. Um, cause you want it to be very compact and then have decent suspension that, you know, it can bounce around while you're driving down the road. But a lot of it, a lot of overlanding has got like compartments and, you know, for your tools and you got to slide out for like the cooking surface and that kind of stuff. It's a cool build, but the sleeping quarters is actually a, a pop-up tent typically like a rooftop tent. So could you take the toy hauler back end of this and then raise it up almost like a, you know, like a roof and could. then create it? You could, you could do that too. I've considered, I've considered moving it all the way up and then having it almost like a garage. And the top was a, you know, a, um, you would have like a ladder that you could climb to the top and have like a, an area on the top that you can hang out. I've considered that as well. Totally think it's a mouse. I agree. Yeah. And then, yeah, Chris, I, I had to, I had to ask the question cause we've been knocking this back and forth for what I know it's, it's, it's now a joke. It's now just a joke. It's now yeah. a running joke. And and so at one time we uh clings for, I got the approval for it, but I had to do it in my way, which was we uh sent a sponsorship for the <laughs> sorry, I have to laugh. We sent a sponsorship amount to Zach to build the off road trailer in the amount of a hundred and twenty three dollars and forty five cents. Yep. Yep. <laughs> yep. I had to make it one, two, three, four. Yep. Five. Yep, and I appreciated it. I just I you know it might I, again, man, I'm just, I'm, I'm really struggling with the, the reasoning to build it. That's what I'm, I'm struggling with. And as it sits right now, um, in the last video, it's the same as what it looks like right now. It's just, you know, under a tarp. Um, I, I mean, I have like over five grand into it as it sits and it's tough because you got to probably put another five or, or more into it to finish it, to get it to a point where you could sell it and potentially make a profit. Right. So it's like, you're kind of in this, this lull of like do you just plow through and finish it and and sell it and get rid of it or do you try to sell it where it's at where some you know take a little bit of a loss and maybe somebody can take it and build something better or do you just wait until that right time comes up where it's like okay this is a good platform for me to build this yeah and that's that's where i'm struggling right now i, I kind of like the uh the toy hauler idea to go along yeah. with it I, that's that's the one that has the most merit for me because like just recently I went out camping for um, I went a uh, tent camping and did some off roading and it was pouring down rain and freezing and I was like oh man this is you know this would be the perfect time to have that overnight toy hauler you know it doesn't have a bathroom and all that stuff but it has a place to put your head you know you know you can stay warm or stay cool mm -hmm. and you know and dry yeah, and then if you need to, and if you need to pull out you know, like leave the campsite early, then you just, you pull the truck, you pull your side by side up on it and you just rock, rock and roll. You're not, you're not worried about, oh, I got to tear this tent down. I got to put it back up when I get home to let it dry out and air out and that kind of stuff. So that was kind of my, my thought. That was always, the, I think the only thing I liked about teardrop, I don't fit in them. I'm way too big for them, but mm. I do like the fact that basically you can just roll out like you're yep. done. It's it's like a smaller version of an RV. That's why I figured maybe Overland would be good. Yeah. Because that way maybe you have a full size Overland edition teardrop. That's why it's so big. <laughs> it's yeah. I mean the the other the other thing too. Um, I don't know if I mentioned this in the video, but the guy that built this, he oh, excuse me, he built it for um, a, a queen size bed, which makes sense. Like moving to that. Uh, into a bigger trailer, you want a queen size bed. But the problem is the inner wall of this, of the teardrop build, the, the off-road one is five foot exactly. So that means the outer wall, the, uh, the walls are um, about two inches. Um, the framing's two inches. So that means that it's five foot four on the outside. And it makes it very hard to get materials that are five foot four inches wide. Mm, I could see that. So that's the other thing that struggles is like, well, I would have been better off to do five foot to the outside, even though it wouldn't be quite a queen and then cut the queen down, like get a foam mattress and cut it, you know, four inches off the side and have, you know, as wide as possible, but not, not the full width. Um, because it's now the materials, finding the materials are going to be even tougher. Yeah, You're going to have to find it six foot. Finding anything that's five foot wide in a Baltic birch is tough enough as it is. So, right. Yep. So in the floor, it's exactly five foot by 10 foot on the inside 
of that thing. So yeah, it just see the struggle there because yeah, all so your materials on the outside and everything. Yeah, along with so it. it just gets it. It just makes it like when you're thinking through it, it just makes it tougher and tougher. Where it's like, ah, you know, do I do I cut it and narrow it to make it easier for me later, or you know, those are the kind of things that go through my head. And then like you'll saw in some of my videos, I ripped out all the the cabinetry he put in place, you know, because they were all just one by one, um, you know, metal framing. And I was like, well, how am I going to add plywood to the metal effectively? Like it would be easier for me to pocket hole plywood to plywood to make a cabinet mm -hmm. than it is for me to try to find tabs or, you know, weld tabs or come up with some type of, you know, figure eight thing to screw to both of the, you know, the wood and the metal. And then you got gaps and everything else. I was like, it's just better off to rip it all out and use you know wood as the structure for it. So that's why I ended up doing that in that video. No, that's a lot smarter way of going about it for what you had, you know, planned on as far as right. use, utilizing that plywood and making the cabinets. It'd be much better to do it without right. the metal. Right. So that's why I ended up ripping that stuff out. So, you know, it's just uh, the whole time. It's like I bought it. I bought it as like, oh, this is cool. I continue on. But the more and more I've gotten into it, it's like, man, I really wish I would have done it differently. You know, so it's like as you're going along, you know, it's just, this is what it is. So it's how creative mind works. It is. Yep. Mm -hmm. It's never too late. It's never too late. That's why, that's why I'm considering getting a new, a new trailer. That's the other, the whole other side of all of this is I got to find a way to get that trailer licensed. So uh, I have to go through the whole title. I have to get it. Uh, inspected, I have to get a VIN number for it and I have to get it licensed in Georgia because it's a homemade trailer. So that's the yeah. other whole, whole part of this I haven't even got into yet. Well, wait, maybe since um, since Angus works in an RV park, he might know someone in Utah. Could we register it in Utah? There we go. We'll register in Utah <laughs> and bring it and then transfer it. So that was the other thing. So sometimes you'll actually see a lot of folks, if you watch uh, builds online, they'll start with a trailer already, like you were from Harbor Freight or something like that. Even my original teardrop trailer was a, was a Harbor Freight trailer that I started with because it's already got the VIN number. It's already, you know, you can, it's easier to go through the registration. So you, you would buy a trailer um, and then go get it registered immediately because it's already can be licensed. And then you do your build on top of that. So it's already done. Before it's already done. Right. Makes things a lot easier. Yeah, I would imagine. So those are the kind of things that's, you know, just logistically you have to think through when building those things. So, so. then make a video series of what not to do. Yeah. And then what not to do. Don't, what not to do. Don't put up five videos and then wait three years to come back to the project. <laughs> it was a small hiatus. I think everyone will a, understand. Right, everybody's small. Yeah. We pick up where you left off. Nobody will ever be the wiser. I mean, your facial hair hadn't changed. I mean, it would be hilarious. You look the off. same. It's yeah. just, yeah, it'll, it'll be fine. <laughs> We've had a couple ideas of like doing some videos of like me camping in the trailer, like, hey, it's done. And then like it, it zooms out and you just see me in the trailer where there's no walls, no ceiling, nothing. You're just, it just zooms out and I'm just laying in there. <laughs> so. We've had some ideas of just, you know, like trying to sprinkle it in there, you know, or having it in the background in one of my shots, you know, it's like, Hey, it's still back there. You know, It should always be in the background. That's, that's, yeah. I like that one. Yeah. Just have it lingering there, not just in a tarp there. necessarily, or it's in a tarp and then someone's behind you and they're yeah. pulling it off, checking it out. And you're like, Hey, don't mess with that. Now's not don't the mess time. With that. Don't touch that. Yeah. No, not, yet. That. Not, not yet. For sale. Not for sale. Yeah. Not for sale. <laughs> But by yeah, the maybe. way, if you're looking for an off-road trailer, five thousand and one dollars, Zach will sell you his. I will. I will sell you. Yeah. Let me know. Or if you got any great ideas, let me know. Like, uh, give me some ideas on what we could do with it. It's, uh, you know, like I said, the challenge. I've I've explained the challenges I've had. Like, I, I just, it's tough. Yeah. And if you need in inspiration, here is some inspiration for yeah. you to get some ideas to to make. Yeah, this you can have you. a mouse. Yep. Put a mouse on top. I was thinking it was more like a bat cycle, like a Batmobile motorcycle. When I first saw it, I was like, dude, he's getting into some crazy superhero stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And if you're looking to upgrade your trailer and transfer your serial number over to that, he's got the trailer for <laughs> yeah. you. Oh, yeah, right. exactly. Bring your own serial number. <laughs> if you work at the DMV, by all means. So what we could do on the back of it is you could have ramps as opposed to it being like a, a, a full full width ramp you could have two separate ramps that you would drive you know with the wheels on it and you could use that as a place to either like change the oil and that stuff in the side by side or you could even park your um you could have a place in the middle to park your motorcycle so if you're not taking the side by side or something that's too wide you can actually just park the motorcycle and take that as well 
So or, you, or it could be a twelve bikes, or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Now, so you're no. coming up with reasons to keep it, Zach. I thought you were looking for reasons not to. I'm trying to sell it to somebody. Like, here's yeah. some ideas to sell. <laughs> yeah. Here's what you could do with <laughs> here's it. Here's what you can do. You know. Uh-huh. Draw that out on some paper to give them just to spur their creativity. Yep. 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 I got great. I got good ideas. I just, you know, I'm just not good at executing them. Apparently. Well, just give it. You know what? It comes with a free set of ideas. Yeah. There you go. That's and what free the one telephone support you. for six months. Yep. <laughs> yeah, oh, man. Yeah, it's 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 been crazy. Like I, I know it's it's been a long time since I've kind of been at steady doing like YouTube videos and stuff. And you know, I think a lot of um, us YouTubers and stuff, we get we hit those walls where we're like, man, it's just it's a grind, and it becomes like it becomes a job. And I, I certainly hit it myself, and just got to a point where I was like, you know, if I'm going to put this much effort into um you know into something like that i need to put it into you know like my relationship and you know family and friends and that kind of stuff and that's that's why i kind of slowed down on that world um especially i got married as you can see here um you know and it's just you know that whole i don't know it for me it's that's that's what i've been putting more focus into um and i've been trying to still sprinkle some videos in there once in a while but um that's why you kind of don't see me doing so many as as much but it's completely understandable because at the time you started doing that, you didn't have her in your life in that capacity, right. and now you right. do. So therefore, priorities change. So yeah, I mean, yeah. it's it's completely understandable. Yeah, yeah, and it's it's I you know I try to I still do a lot of stuff, but I'm like I'm almost like is it worth taking the time to video it? Is it going to be yeah. something that somebody wants to like that would enjoy? Yeah. You know, some people tell me like they like hearing the story about why I did something. Some people are like, I don't care about the story. I just want the 30 second synopsis. So mm-hmm. it's like, you know, it's really hard to please everybody, of course. Of course. And that's really whenever you can see, I took a hiatus from Instagram for a little bit just to kind of reset everything. But one of the things I liked about it is that I could just hold the story button and then just do whatever sure. I was doing at the moment. Zero yep. editing, <clears throat> nothing yep. else extra. Just hit it, show people what I'm doing and be done. Yep. And I did like that aspect of it. Yep. Yeah. And that's tough. It's, it's really tough when you starting to put a lot of like, I guess if it's your full-time thing, there's, there's some more to it than that. Um, but like, I just started a new job as well. Like um, three, two, two months ago, just started a brand new job. So it's like trying to get in grain with a new company and this company's massive. So it's like learning everybody, you know, just getting to meet everybody and learning the process. It's tough. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. So you end up putting a lot of extra hours in up front, even though it's a nine to five job, but you're, you're putting in a lot of extra hours. So, and a lot of extra headspace to go <clears> along <throat> with it. Yep. So, and I'm always tinkering, man. Like uh, you see, kind of see it blurred out behind me. Like I, I um, got into keyboard, like um, different keyboards and stuff. So now that, that one is, I built that one for, for my, um, for work. <laughs> Sweet. Yeah. So I was, I was sort of, I want to get really, I want to build my own eventually. This one is just a a razor, but I I got it so that I could uh, change the keys. And it's actually got the orange, if you know what they are, the orange key caps and, or the the key clickies and stuff. So it's nice and noisy, you know, it's mechanical keyboard. Yeah. I like mechanical keyboards. There's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. So like the old typewriter a little bit. Yeah, exactly. And I've, I 3d printed some of the keys. Um, Like the escape key is actually like a skull and the and the light shines through its eyes nice so just something fun like I, i'm always tinkering with something i just i just never know it's like should i show this should i not i don't know that's where that's where the southern woodworkers kind of comes into play just kind of show people what you're still doing but you're sure. not having to go into the whole you know uh video yeah. production of it i guess you'd say yeah i started posting some more stuff on instagram um showing some of the stuff that i've been working on recently you know but uh a lot of I've been in a lot of weddings recently. All of a sudden, <laughs> everybody's getting married. Um, so I've been doing like a, you know cornhole sets for weddings and that kind of stuff. Always good gifts. Yeah, all the, I feel like all the cornhole sets I've ever made are always been gifts. Sounds about right. Yep. Yeah. So. Well, clearly, uh, if you didn't know him before, you know him now. Yes, Zach is into just a few things. <laughs> And go two. check out one of his 8,000 YouTube channels to figure out exactly which content you're looking for. And then uh, if you want to join in on the Facebook group, it is the Southern Woodworkers. Most oh, yeah, live that's in the South. One. Yeah, right there. Yeah. 
And uh, unless Orgami. you're from Northeast Pennsylvania, <laughs> you should only be in the South. That's right. Check out the map requirements before you click uh, to follow or join the group. Yeah, that is kind of fun to have the map, I do have to say, just mm-hmm. to see everybody on there and where they're from. That was cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, of course, uh, learnyourcnc.com. Thank you, Kyle. Thank you, John and Michelle, for being Patreons. We appreciate your support. If you would like to be a Patreon, then please jo- uh, visit us at patreon.com whatnot podcast. I think that's all the plugging I had. <laughs> if you'd just like to say hi, jump in the comments and just say hi. And yeah, if you would like to just annoy Chris, then by all means, team chamfer the crap out of the comment section. And if you've got any ideas about uh, what Zach should do with his trailer, join Southern Woodworkers and message him. Just put posts on there. He should do this. He should do this. Eh, we'll see what happens. Yeah. <laughs> for, He's got for, his bo- post. for both of our viewers, I doubt anything will happen for you there, Zach. But hey. <laughs> I appreciate all the help, man. I really do. All right. There we go. Well, everybody, thank you for joining us. Zach, thank you so much for joining us. Last sure. minute on that one, I have to say. I appreciate yeah, you. Thank jump, you. Jump appreciate it. Yeah, I was dinner right before. I was all prepared to book you for like mid February. Next thing, hey, I'm oh, I'm open Wednesday. Well, hey, we are too. Let's knock <laughs> this thing down. <laughs> hey man, let's get it over with, right? So I like it. Yeah, rip yeah. the band-aid right off. We That's right. Appreciate it. That's right. Well, appreciate you. Thank you so much for joining us. Everyone, thank you for watching and after the fact, as well as listening to us on your favorite podcast service, Apple, Google, you name it. It's all out there somewhere. And so uh we'll end it with that. Thank you again, and everyone have a good night. See you next time. See ya.